publishing it with the participants. Thanks a lot. Super. Super. So just for, let's start with a quick introduction to Swarovski so you know a little bit the magnitude the, of the company, the context. And I hope that most of you know our brands because usually we are, it's a quite popular brand, but usually people don't really uh, perceive the, the, the size of the company and also about the complexity of our business. So yeah, first, it's a family company. It's a family which has been founded 125 years uh, ago by a, a visionary called uh, Daniel Swarovski, who wanted basically to use electricity for producing crystal. And uh, that's why he moved to Austria uh, it's, it's in Tyrol because it could get very cheap uh, electricity there thanks to all the water which was coming from the, from the mountains. And this has grown and grown. And this is now what you see on the, on the screen. Uh, hopefully you can see well the slide because it's a bit cut on, uh, for me. Uh, but we, it's now the fifth generation which is running this. The, com the, the headquarter is officially still in Austria, but the reality is that most of the head functions are in Switzerland where we are with Monia close to Zurich because of course there the job market is much more favorable. We have overall 30,000 employees worldwide. So it's not a, such a small company because we have a very, very long value chain, right? So this is something which is also a very, makes a very interesting playground for us uh, is that we are producing crystal. This crystal is then transformed into goods. Like for instance, you know, I'm sure the jewelry, for instance, uh, will come, that, uh, come, to, come to this. And then this is then sold also through our retail network, right? So we are, we are also running ourselves uh, thousands of stores to, to access our customers. Of course, we have outputs before. So we have also partner retailers. We, have also, we are also selling B2B, uh, the crystal itself. So we have a lot of outputs. So this makes that this, there is a very, very interesting playground because we have a very long value chain. We are not only a manufacturer, we are not only a retailer, we have all integrated. And as you see, we have a, a revenue of about 3.5 billion. Uh, this was in 2019. Of course, 2020 was a little bit lower, as you can imagine, but uh, still, still quite material. And again, a very long value chain, so quite a, a high margin. And um, yeah, let's continue. So basically overall, this has built over these 20, 125 years, a group with, which has really as a center, as a epicenter, the crystal. So here we have, uh, so basically just that you know the, the bit of products, this is the new collections which are starting here. So we have also a huge transformation running at Swarovski level, right? We want to move to the next level uh, and become, let's say, what we call attainable luxury. So we have a new creative design and this is an example of the new of the new collection. And this is basically what we call the consumer good business. So this is what usually people know Swarovski for, right? Because that's what you find in the stores uh, in, in the stores, in the Swarovski stores or in the multi-brand stores where Swarovski products are broadcasted. So continue. So this is the second business, less, less known, but also very important because it was also a building, let's say Swarovski over the, the decades. This is the B2B business. So we are selling components to many other brands. So for instance, if you buy uh, clothing from uh, uh, Chanel, from Dior, but also maybe uh, some brands a bit lower, like, like uh, Supreme or, or Boss, uh, they use uh, Crystal to pimp up the, the 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 to make it to make it more appealing. Right? So, sorry, I think it was a uh, someone. Uh... Okay. okay, sorry. So yeah, so this is our B two B business. This is how it has built the the company. So it was the first business, and today we rather reduce it to keep it really as also as an image builder. So for us, it's great, of course, to, to partner with, uh, with, with luxury uh, brands, but we don't want, let's say, to sell our brands to some uh, spare parts to, me, to too many uh, brands, which are not at our level, let's say, uh, in, the, in the pyramid. If we continue, then we have something also quite interesting is that we have a very large amusement park all around the, 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 the crystal, which is based in Austria, so really the, the historical headquarter. And this is, a, this is the second most visited place in Austria, right? So this drives a revenue of more than 50 million. So it's not that, that small. Going forward, these are examples of products. So these are the collaboration, especially that happens on this B2B. So for instance, we have also collaboration with Nike these last days. There was an announcement that there is a new pair of, Ni of Nike shoes fully crystallized. And here, this is an example with Adidas. Uh, this, is, this is also from the, from, the, from, the, from the crystal world. And uh, basically you can see a little bit at night how it looks like. So I think we can go on with the, with the pictures, uh, Moya. Yeah, and basically you see it on the, on the left side. 
So we can, let's, let's just make all the older picture. So we have the, the illustration and basically we can see on the left side. So we have these consumer goods. We have a gemstone business. We are also selling uh, precious stones to, to many brands. Uh, we have this tourism, I've already mentioned it. Sourski Professional, this is the B2B business. We have the lightning and direct selling. These are smaller business, but we also produce, let's say, a huge chandelier, for instance, for, 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 for hotels. This is also one, one typical business. Uh, and we have two other brands, which are, which are very independent. So they are not fully supported by us only for the financial part, I would say. And, and this, this, this is Tyrolit, which is a company producing the machines, which allows to cut and grind the stones and the crystal, for instance, and Optic, which is maybe known by some of you, which is, which is producing uh, binoculars, uh, rifles for uh, quite high, high, high quality ones, usually for hunters or for nature lovers. Right? On both sides, you might, you might like it. So this is in a nutshell what is Swarovski. And now these are just your speakers. So Monia, just maybe I let you introduce yourself first very briefly. Yeah, of course, I also don't want to waste in some out too much time. I think we have quite some content in the slides. Uh, but yeah, I, of course, joined Swarovski uh, more than a year ago, one and a half year ago, and I'm currently leading the data science team. So this is why, of course, I'm happy also to present some use cases that we are running or that we run in the past. And for on my side, I'm leading the data analytics function. I'm with Sorsky now for about for nine years, and basically my journey has been to build this function. Of course, with all the deliverables together, but let's say this has really been the, the my, my my way at Sorsky and a very interesting path, I would say. So let's let's continue and move on. So I would like to quickly share uh, how we are. I'm also conscious about the time because I don't want to to spoil uh, the time for for Monia, uh, with, with very interesting content to share with you. If we just move now to the next, oh so yeah, just to present to you uh, our vision, mission, and how we are organized. So our, our view is really to transform the, the culture, right? I, I talked before uh, about the data culture. This is something which is very important. We, could, we are from a family business uh, where we want to drive emotions for our customers. This, this, will, this doesn't change and will not change, but we want that internally our decisions are driven by by facts right so we want and we want to a decision being data driven and the decision they can be strategic decisions they can be daily operations decisions they can be also operations left to uh, let's say decisions left to machines as well right but that we come to uh, rationalization right this is something that we need for improving let's say our quality and moving to the next level of uh, uh, in the in the customer uh, perception right this attainable luxury and we want of course to improve let's say our profitability and basically here you see our mission, let's say, which is reflecting the fact that on one end we care for the data, we want to govern the data for all processes. And on the other side, we also want, let's say, to address with analytics products and enabling decision-making and process optimization, right? So this is, this, this is the view which makes, to my view, our data analytics function relatively complete from data governance to data science. But now we can move to the next slide and I can share basically what is included there. So basically, you see it from left to right, we have, let's say, the lowest enablers to the highest enablers. And all are very, very uh, important. Of course, there is no hierarchization there of which one is more important than the other one. But what is important is that we cannot deliver strong data science products without strong data engineering. And we, can, and we cannot really also engineer information if the data is not at the right quality, right? Because of course you can do it, but the quality, the quality of the outcome will also be poor. So this is how we are organized. You see a little bit of, of numbers and organization wise. So today at Swarovski, there is one board with seven members and we are just positioned below that in a, in a grouping of two functions, let's say controlling and data analytics, data analytics being our function. Uh, we have about 45 FTs for more than 5,000. 500 users, so quite a large community. This is why we have to also care a lot about our own processes and also the governance when it comes to the support. Uh, this is something also very important for efficiency. And again, this is important for efficiency, but also for the adoption, right? Because we really want to reach everyone in the company. We want that also the blue collars they can perceive the performance of their, uh, of their production site. We want that every sales consultant is aware about the sales performance of his store on the real time, right? This is what we want to do. We don't, we don't do that only for a bunch of 
people very high in the head quarter, right? This is, this is very important to us. And today we are almost fully consolidated. So this has been the work of quite many years to really combine all these resources under one organization. Today, the only exception is on the data science, actually, when there is a, a second team, a smaller team uh, based directly in strategy. But for the rest, everything that you see here, it is fully consolidated under one organization. And here, basically, quickly to the service portfolio. So, of course, this is dri driven by our strategy. As now we have quite transformed the organization, we have also, let's say, defined a new strategy for the next five years. And here, basically, you see our, our services. I will try to keep it really short now, but basically, the typical data, gov what, we, what we bring under the term governance is actually also data architecture, data quality, and very important, the performance management. It's important to measure the impact of data governance to keep the, the network fully engaged, right? And on top of that, we have what we call analytics products. Yeah, here it's coming. Yeah, and here basically we have also identified several analytics products that we de de deliver. So everything which is about standard reporting, so everything which enable, let's say, exploration or ad hoc analysis, the data science products, of course, this we will see more, the provisioning, because sometimes we just provision to other operational systems because our platform is required, or let's say our engineering is required to, to bring this information. And, and, and last, and it's a bit of a niche, we also have specific services, let's say, for planning and consolidation because they are the support concept and the complexity makes that we need to have a specific uh, competency for that. So we can go next. And basically, I just wanted to share with you four uh, lesson learns out of this. Uh, this is, of course, the, the, my view, right? This is to be, to be debated and to be challenged. So the first one is that we, we need data governance. This is this underpins all the other activities and it underpins the growth of data analytics. And, and the, the quality of the data and this collective ownership and stewardship, which is required to get to this quality, this is the key driver, this is one key driver for changing the culture. And this will enable us. This is the this is the hardest one to sell. It took us very, very long to really sell it also internally, and we are still on the on the on the way to adopt it, but this is absolutely necessary work. To my view, uh, also one principle as we have just now defined our an upcoming strategy. We hear very often between offensive and defensive strategies. Uh, I don't believe so much that we need to make a segregation there. I think you need both. You need both because you don't have, let's say, uh, the data science and the uh, appealing uh, reporting dashboarding. You will not engage with the stakeholders. But if in the meantime, you also don't make the right effort and you push hard to get your data engineering, your data governance, or what I call data foundations here in order, you will not, it will not fly. So you will also lose your stakeholders at a later point uh, in, in time. So this is really uh, both have to be combined. And to also to decouple from technology. Uh, for instance, not opposing data warehousing and data lake. I heard many times here, yeah, we have classic BI and we have advanced this is not our view. Again, this is a, an opinion. Huh? Don't get me wrong, but but this is our view is that we need to really be information centric and to leave it up to the full to the full extent. So we work very hard to try to create a single point of truth to try to create a conceptual information architecture which is over the the, the system architecture. And last, it's a big transformation, right? So be ready. It will, it will be tough if you start the journey, if you want to own this position uh, on uh, leading the data analytics transformation, uh, you will be challenged, you will be questioned, you will be criticized. What, what has to be what, the key success factor beyond even the, 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 the expertise that you have to bring uh, is, is also the communication and the change management. So this is really what has to be challenged. And to my view, before, before your guiding principles, right? Because some days, some days you think, okay, it will not, we will not make it. But actually, it's just about reworking again the, the the communication, the change management, the approach, how to convince people, and ultimately, hopefully, it will work. And this was my last slide now.
Perfect. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. Uh, so I also tried to use, let's say, 10 minutes, more or less, uh, to, to um, give you some examples of consumer analytics journey that we have um, done in, in Swarovski uh, with three examples. I just picked up three uh, that hopefully are, are easy also to grasp and to describe in a couple of minutes. Uh, first being the global recommendation engine. Um, so it's a typical uh, recommendation system. I think uh, most of you uh, may be uh, familiar with uh, what the recommendation system is. And just to give you also some, some more detail, I mean, first of all, on the, on the why. Um, so why do we build a recommendation engine? Um, mainly because we know that if we engage our consumer, we actually create a real relationship between the brand and our consumer. So we communicate also with our consumer in a more targeted way, and the consumer themselves also feel um, kind of more listened, and uh, not that we just send out um, communication without being connected to them. Um, so just also briefly what it is. Um, so it's actually an algorithm that runs since uh, actually a couple of years uh, productively every day. And it basically is screened through our consumer databases. And we are talking about uh, 35 million consumer, uh, more or less at the current uh, stage, um, and basically it runs to their demographic uh, data, but also on the transaction history that it's available to us. And uh, it basically tries to um, suggest uh, the most relevant product. And most relevant product means uh, the products that are very likely to be bought uh, in the next purchase for the customers. So it combines, let's say, this demographic and transactional information, but on top it adds uh, stock availability information. This is mainly we don't want to recommend um, products that are not available in our in our stores or in our in our warehouse, and of course trending product, which is also very um, very important. For example, when we have new product launches, right? Clearly we don't have uh, transactional data that we can kind of learn from, uh, but we need to in somehow include it in our uh, recommendation system. And then finally, how is this used concretely? Uh, so basically, we uh, we uh, run this algorithm automatically, and then we send uh, this data to our CRM system. And depending on the campaign that they want to, to run, they basically pick up uh, the selection of the items that we build. And um, why is it so important? They said, um, we, we really want to uh, engage our customers, and we also want to provide them uh, trust so that they can trust us. And of course, for us, it's also very important because on a very uh, let's say basic um, understanding. Of course, uh, we are talking about uh, tailoring made the offer, eventually also the production, and of course uh, optimize our resources. So also the CRM campaigns. Of course, it doesn't come for free, uh, so we want to try to optimize as much as we can. And uh, when we started um, piloting this exercise, uh, what we um, realize is that actually if we compare a campaign that have been personalized with campaign that have not been personalized, there is a significant increase in revenues so up to 50%, which um, mm. it's, yes, I don't know who is commenting, Ooh, but sorry. yes, no, no, it's uh, definitely uh, a good comment. Um, yeah, up to 50% revenue increase. So it's, it's definitely quite, uh, quite relevant. Now, if uh, just also to give you a bit uh, of an excursus of how actually it works, uh, also for the people that are more interested in, in, in the real, let's say, artificial intelligence part of how to build a use case. Of course, these are the four main pillars, which I think are also common to uh, many other use cases. Uh, so from the data preparation uh, with the different modeling phase up to the finalization of the, of the product. So uh, data preparation, I say, I don't want to spend too much time, but basically the idea is that we combine really um, as many data sources as we can. So of course, our, our consumer data, which is of course very rich, um, the transactional data, uh, but also specific uh, data marts that we have built over time uh, to, to summarize as much as possible and to gain as much insight as possible from our uh, consumer. Then in the second phase is the clear uh, modeling phase. Also there, we try to uh, basically build different techniques uh, for also different purposes, right? I think I was mentioning before, of course, for, for example, for new products, we cannot simply look at historical data. We simply don't have historical data. So we need to come up, let's say, with different techniques. So we built, let's say, different uh, modules in somehow, and then we combine them together. 
Then there is also a kind of a post-modeling processing. Um, so there um, we also want to include certain business logics. Um, I think also clear to say that, um, let's say, past data do not always represent also the future. Uh, if there are specific actions that uh, either the marketing team or the CRM team want to include, of course, this is not something that is already captured in the data. So we will need to um, almost manually uh, insert some business logic behind. And then on the very last uh, part, of course, the finalization, which means also uh, historizing, of course, what we've done and clearly also make it available to the CRM system, which is also very important, of course, that can be uh, picked up automatically. And uh, we make sure that every time there is a campaign launch, um, it's everything is actually available and we don't have also uh, interruptions. Um, connected to it, uh, but also slightly different in somehow. It's another example that I would like to show you that we have done in the past. Um, it's a style finder. So it's a real kind of consumer experience that happened in the store, which kinds of leverage also the, the GRE that I showed you before, uh, but adds, let's say, some other features. So more or less, the purpose is still the same, right? We want to engage our customers. Um, what do we do? Uh, or one of the, the, the kind of the exercises we decided to do is to basically select certain stores and provide the stores with a tablet. And in the tablet, of course, the consumer can enter the store, can kind of play with the tablet. And one of the features that we provide is uh, to basically offer them different uh, different. Um, kind of pictures um, from which they can select their style. Um, once they select their style, um, what happens is that depending on the style that they suggested, we provide kind of live cross-selling suggestions. Um, meaning, of course, we need to make sure that clearly um, also what we have learned from different transactions in the past, not necessarily offline, also from the online transaction are considered, but also the specific uh, stock that are available. Again, we don't want to um, suggest products that are actually not available in the store. Also there, when we did this exercise in the first uh, piloting store, what we observed is that the conversion rate uh, were up to 45% of all consultation. So if we consider only the clients that have been, let's say, playing or engaging with the tablet, uh, we could actually uh, convert the, 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 the potential consumer in real consumer up to 45% uh, more. And not only that, which is again already quite a gain, uh, but we also observed that the value per ticket uh, that of the transaction was 50% percent higher, uh, meaning the people that actually use the tablet to discover the style and being also suggested, they tend to spend actually more. Um, so overall, again, we had actually great results. We, we also then brought this, um, this um, uh, kind of a consumer experience in, in different countries. And we are now um, currently discussing which other country to eventually uh, bring up to speed. So also here, we observed uh, quite some net sales uplift. Um, a very last example, trying also to be conscious of the time. Um, another. I mean, uh, wanted to ask to take some questions. I don't know. Yes, what, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't see the screen. So yes. if there are some questions, maybe. Two minutes yeah. we have. If there is any question, please. Yeah, we're really happy. Um, in the meantime, if there is no question also written in the chat, which again, I cannot see. So please, someone help me if uh, there is someone, uh, yeah, some perfect. questions popping up in the chat. Uh, the very last uh, use case, uh, it's an image-based product search, um, which is a bit more uh, innovative solution, let's say. It's still in a POC phase. Uh, but the idea behind is basically to, to build an app, which can be used by uh, Swarovski consumer, but also by non Swarovski consumers. And the idea is that um, the people can, can simply upload a picture or take a picture uh, clearly with a piece of jewelry. And the algorithm behind will find um, basically the most similar product within our Swarovski catalog. So the, the jewelry, uh, so the picture itself can be from any other um, jewelry or any other. Uh, brand. Um, this is not, let's say, the important part, but what we are going to do is actually to select the most similar Swarovski product. And again, maybe for the, the, the people are more interested in actually how it works concretely. So there are kind of three layers, so three um, 
kind of uh, um, uh, machine learning layers. The very first one, it's uh, kind of the object detection. So the first part of the algorithm just simply um, takes out of the picture the jewelry piece, uh, which is not always very straightforward. Then there is a second layer that basically um, also try to, to um, differentiate between the jewelry type, right? So is it a, a ring? Is it a necklace? Is it a watch? Uh, so this is the second layer. And then the very first layer is actually within um, the, the, the category of the jewelry, try to find a similar product. And similar product, of course, uh, can be similar shape, can be um, the same color of the gems, for example, of the crystals, or it can be also the plating. So this, we just try to find the most um, similar algorithm. So I said, this is still kind of in a POC phase, but um, we actually think it's a very, um, a very interesting feature that can be used again by Swarovski consumer or new consumers. So I think we are perfectly on time. Um, we still have five minutes for, for questions. Thanks. So it's my fault. We are out of time, but it's my fault. So I pay back for the five minutes. Uh, we will have a bit of delay, five minutes for the lunch time. So guys, questions, please. Uh, there so was a question in the from, chat. There were some questions in the chat. Yes, Mookie. there is a question from uh, Sean. Who quantifies those amazing business impacts you showed? Is it in the partnership with business? So the, to quantify actually is also us. So us meaning also as a data science or also part of the other teams within data analytics. So we, we really try to quantify, we do some, some kind of A-B testing or we, we make sure that we are able to measure that. Uh, so of course it's in collaboration with the business that so the business always comes to us a bit with the target, right? What they want to achieve, uh, but we normally are, let's say responsible then to measure it. Important is that we always work, all the, all the products which are generated, the data science product in that case, are always a collaboration, right? So this one is a really a close collaboration with CRM. And, uh, but to be, to be honest, it was us, let's say, telling, uh, telling them before, and we need to think about setting control groups because we want to measure the impact of this, right? We cannot just go wide and just uh, roll out to every customer and we have no idea what is the real impact, right? So this has been measured, I think, as good as we could. But we have, we have really put something in place to do this measurement. It's not something just like this. Uh, that was uh, Sean from uh, the Taiku, very active, asking questions now. Uh, you once, uh, uh, do you, the question is that, do you use any predictive analytics in the production process of the gems? Gems? Uh, yeah, I, we are also, let's say, working together with production. Uh, we did some very interesting uh, uh, use cases in the past, and uh, we are now also kicking off, let's say, a, a major project with production. Uh, what we did in the past is, for example, um, predictive analytics. So try to use the data from the sensors of the machines uh, and try to optimize certain parameters of the, of the robot. So definitely something that we uh, started to do some years ago and we'll definitely continue in the future. But we Thank now you so much. Some on marketing, sales, and basically now what we really want to go is exactly for production. We want to bring it to the next level. So we have to pick on the table like predictive maintenance, error detection, also being able to predict the right settings for the machines for all the novelties products. These are really important. Uh, use cases that we want to drive in the coming years because these are they are very complex as well, so it will take some time. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Andrea Zino from Dino. I apologize. Still, keep with us two more minutes delay. Then we will compensate. The question is about product uh, recommendation engine. The data on customers' preference that you use in the model prediction are both externally or collected internally. Uh, we mainly have internal data. I mean, clearly we know our consumers and uh, clearly for the transaction is is absolutely internal data. So our store, we, we, we track, right? We track what we sell to our stores and we track what then the stores are selling back to the final consumer. So we uh, definitely can, of course, whenever we can recognize, right? That is our consumer. So mainly um, when the, the consumer is also showing a loyalty card or they are collecting points. Uh, and of course, for the transaction online, uh, this is everything then stored in our, in our database. So it's definitely uh, internal data. 
Perfect. So guys, I know there are many questions. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Monia and Thomas, for your incredible presentation. I loved it. It's recorded. We'll be sharing after your permission, of course, with the public as well to see. No uh, just to tell everybody, we will make a LinkedIn account for this group so you can ask questions in future, later on after the event, to be in contact together all the time, yeah? So thank you so much, Thomas, again, and Monia. A big thank you all. For this